Hello, and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. I'm Marvin Krizlov, president of Oberlin College and a proud member of the City Club. I am honored to introduce our speaker today, Neil Barsky. Mr. Barsky is the founder and chair of a new investigative journalism project focused on the criminal justice system. It is called the Marshall Project. According to a recent report by the National Academy of Sciences, the United States prison population is 2.2 million, the highest in the world. To provide some perspective, in 1973, that number was approximately 200,000. Today, we incarcerate one in every 100 adults. That's five to 10 times higher than most other democratized nations around the world. We comprise 5% of the world's population, but we house 25% of the world's prisoners. Clearly, our criminal justice system is in dire need of scrutiny. The Marshall Project was founded earlier this year and named after Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. It is dedicated to providing up-to-the-minute news, in-depth reporting, and informed, insightful commentary about criminal justice in an attempt to create a groundswell of support for reform. Mr. Barsky is a strong advocate of the power of storytelling to create social change. Through his remarkable and multifaceted career in journalism, finance, and filmmaking, he has worked to keep the American public engaged in conversation about ways to improve literacy, strengthen education, and promote social justice. Through the Marshall Project, Mr. Barsky aims to do the same for our criminal justice system. Prior to creating the Marshall Project, Mr. Barsky enjoyed a distinguished career, including co-founding the hedge fund Midtown Capital, as well as Alston Capital Partners, which at its peak had $3.5 under billion dollars under management. After retiring from investment business in 2009, he directed the film Koch, a documentary, the critically acclaimed documentary film about New York's former mayor, which was released theatrically in 2013 and recently was shown on public television. Mr. Barsky is a former reporter for the New York Daily News and the Wall Street Journal. He has also worked as an equity research analyst for Morgan Stanley. In 1997, he was ranked the number one lodging and game analyst in the Institutional Investor Magazine poll. He also has ties to our region, Northeast Ohio. He is a graduate of Oberlin College, class of 1981, and has served as a visiting assistant professor of economics. He has also served as a member of our Board of Trustees since 2008. Ladies and gentlemen, members and friends of the City Club of Cleveland, please join me in welcoming Neil Barsky, founder and chair of the Marshall Project. Uh, thank you, President Krizlov. Um, it's really an honor to be here, and I'm really uh, quite flattered that uh, uh, the City Club has invited me, uh, invited me here. Um, it's a great showing of my Oberlin friends. Uh, Maureen Mullen, who is, uh, works uh, in Cleveland at the uh, Public Library, is my liaison to this event, and I'm so appreciative of my friend Fred Cummings. I'm just mentioning Oberlin graduates who have really helped me stay engaged with this region and this, and this, and this city, um, and so without them I, I wouldn't be here. Um, I want to start sort of with a little autobiography um, because in many ways I feel I am maybe the least qualified person or among the least qualified people in this room to be speaking about criminal justice. Um, I know there are attorneys here. I know there are people who have been in the system here. Um, I'm not an attorney. Uh, I've never engaged in the criminal justice system directly, probably for the good. Um, and I spent my life, if you look at my resume, there's really very little to suggest that I have any insight or special expertise in criminal justice. And in fact, I don't. I'm a student. And like hopefully people in this room, I'm, I'm on a learning curve that hopefully is very steep because over the last several years, <clears throat> as I'm going to explain, I had come to see this system that in all forms is truly a national disgrace. And again, I'm not claiming to have made any amazing discovery, um, but I want to just say right out the bat, I'm not an attorney. I'm going to be speaking way over my head a little bit, and I, I, I would hope that you bear with me and feel free to correct me in the Q&A. But um, uh, see me as a student and an advocate and a citizen, um, but not necessarily an expert. Um, uh, my background, as Marvin said, I was a journalist in my first career. Uh, I was a business reporter. I covered real estate. I covered economic development. Um, but I think I like to think my real education started well before um, uh, before work, before Oberlin. Uh, my, Parents grew up in the West Bronx of New York. They were the sons and daughter, son and daughter of immigrants. 
Um, and when they were in their 20s, they scraped together a little mortgage and moved to Long Island, which was a burgeoning suburb outside New York City. And my father was an attorney, um, and he quickly became engaged in the Congress of Racial Equality, CORE, which was a civil rights movement. And um, these were new suburbs being built in Long Island, and it quickly became apparent that there were builders that would not sell to black families. Uh, only wanted you know to keep these uh, the suburbs white. So my parents would pose as a control group. They would go to a house that was for sale. They'd say, "We'd like to buy your house, Mr. Jones." Then a black family would go and say the same thing. And by very virtue of how they were treated, oh, I'm sorry, it's not available. It's available. They would uh, eventually have, I believe, um, civil litigation against the builders. So they were always engaged. And we went to the Vietnam War. You know, active in the Vietnam War movement. My father did many other things in the civil rights movement, of which I'm very proud. But I was a small child at the time. So I'd like to think there are antecedents to what I'm doing today, even though, um, as I said, there's nothing on my resume that would suggest that this is a natural progression. In fact, um, it is something that really has just struck me uh, a couple of years ago. Um, I, uh, I am coming to this. Um, let me ask a question. How many people here are soccer fans? How many people here 10 years ago? And you guys can't raise your hands because you're, you're aged out of this survey, but we're so, would consider themselves soccer fans. I don't mean playing. I mean uh, relatively few. And I'm going to just describe something that is almost like a Malcolm Gladwell moment. About 10 or 12 years ago, I was managing a hedge fund, and I would encounter frequent um, insomnia. Um, Fred Cummings is a hedge fund manager. I'm going to give him a commercial. He may know what I'm talking about. And I'd wake up in the middle of the night. I'd turn the television on, and invariably what would be on would be uh, Fox soccer. And I would be watching English football. And I just got entranced by it. And a few years would pass, and now I became a big soccer fan. And then I'd meet a guy, and he was a junior year abroad in Europe, and he'd become a soccer fan. And then I'd meet somebody else, and through some serendipitous way, they'd become soccer fans. And then all of a sudden, this summer, the World Cup came, and the whole country was soccer fans. And why am I mentioning this? Because there was something percolating out there, something un indescribable. They tried to make soccer in the United States popular for 50 years. But there's a moment going on in, 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 the, in, the, in the American engagement with soccer. Why am I mentioning this? Because I think the same thing is actually happening in criminal justice. I don't think the Marshall Project has discovered anything. I don't think we're going to cause anything. I think we'll do great work. But I actually think we're in a very similar moment in our country in criminal justice. There are so many random, unrelated things going on in the country, which I would argue are positive, where more and more people from different walks of life from different political perspectives, from different parts of the country, are gradually realizing that our criminal justice system is a national disgrace. Rand Paul, libertarian senator, has a lot of opinions that might be unpopular in this room, including with me. He just sponsored a bill with uh, Democratic Senator Cory Booker uh, called the Redeem Act, which is going to make it, would, would if it were passed, which it won't be, unfortunately, but it would make it easier for uh, convicts to uh, re-enter the workforce. Um, this guy is a Republican. Um, I could tell you the governors of the various states that have done uh, reform. The Texas is actually a very right-wing state, a red state. It is pioneering criminal justice reform. Why? Because building prisons is expensive and it's not working. And so they said, well, we have to, we're, we're going broke. We have to build fewer prisons. And they named a guy, a state senator who I met. He was an accountant. His name was Jerry Madden. And he looked, he said, you know one way to lower the population of prisons? Drug rehabilitation for, for addicts and uh, education for unmarried moms. So, um, um, so what I'm trying to say is that there's a lot of things fermenting right now in the country. And I like to think that the Marshall Project is part of that. And so when you're in a good moment, of course, it's good to claim credit, which probably we will one day. I hope we do. But the reality is, I think we're in a very important part of our country that's based on a few things, point in our country's history, based on a 20-year decline in violent crime, so crime itself as a fact of life in our lives, fortunately, has gone down. We can behave less emotionally. A lot of bad laws are passed in the wake of very horrible crimes. Um, and I also think that, as Marvin um, spoke of earlier, we have, it's sinking in that we are the largest incarcerator in the world, maybe not in gross numbers, but as a percentage of our population. There's two and a half million people in jail. It's 1% of our country, but there are three or four times of that affected by that because we have mothers and fathers and sisters and brothers. The only country we compete with in terms of how large a percentage of our incarcerated people uh, are in our prisons is North Korea. 
we're sort of neck and neck. Um, and so I think we're at a good moment. Now I'm going to go back and just tell you about my own engagement because everybody, you know, arrives at things differently. So I made this film on Ed Koch, um, uh, which was about New York, and it's just, you know, it's sort of about a very uh, larger-than-life, charming mayor who's funny, and I wanted to tell the story of New York City, and I was finished with the work about a couple of years ago, and I was talking to a friend, and she's an attorney, and she recommended a book, uh, The New Jim Crow. Uh, has anybody heard of The New Jim Crow? Okay, so uh, it is something of the Bible now, of mass incarceration movement. It came two years ago as an attorney who uh, uh, was working, I think, at the time for the ACLU. She's a professor in Ohio, in fact, Michelle Alexander. And she had a thesis. Uh, and the thesis is that mass incarceration, as she defined it, is a third phase of oppression of African Americans in our country. The first phase was slavery. The second was Jim Crow. But that mass incarceration so impacted the black community and was so, in her view, a backlash against certain progressive things that were happening that she actually framed this. The name of the book is as powerful as the book itself. And there are things in the book I don't agree with, and there are approaches she took I, didn't, I, I would not take. But I was so humbled by reading it because I had not made connections. I hadn't made the connection that since the war on drugs in the early 80s, since we criminalized behavior that is really a health issue, in my opinion, the population had quadrupled. The prison population from 1982 quadrupled while crime is plummeting. And we weren't putting, and crime is not plummeting because we're putting more and more violent people in jail. Crime is plummeting, excuse me, the rate is, is, is going up, not because, excuse me. Um, crime is plummeting not because we're putting violent people in jail. The people we're putting in jail are, have, because of the new laws that were passed and President Clinton actually kicked in in 1994 with another terrible bill, uh, we're putting people in prison for longer and for more and more drug-related, often, um, uh, uh, crimes. So I'm reading, and I'm thinking, well, okay, I, and I just started to do a deep dive. I had some time in my hands. And I was reading, and I read a lot. Not books, just online, waste time, like probably half the people in this room. <laughs> and I started noticing that every day I would read something about the criminal justice system that was completely outrageous that if it wasn't happening in this country, you wouldn't believe it. And I'll give you a mild example. This happened recently. A woman in, in Texas was 42 years old, probably mentally ill, and she posed as a high school student, and she went to high school for six months. That's kind of funny, probably awkward, so what do you do? You throw her in jail for 48 days. A mother recently had a, um, uh, an interview, I think at McDonald's, and she let her kid play in, in, in the park. Uh, the kid was nine years old, unintended. Mother went to jail for 18 days. These are small things, but they indicate how the default mechanism in our country is so much going to jail. So I had this idea, really modest idea, to hire some kid and have a site, Outrage of the Day. Every day just have an outrage and maybe get a little traffic and, 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 um, and build it. And uh, I took it to somebody in the criminal justice field who I respect. His name is Herb Sturz. He's a legend in New York. He says, what are you doing? you got to think big a little bit. And so I, I did. And I started really thinking through what really we needed to do. And what I quickly discovered was that I hadn't discovered anything, that there were people in this room uh, who worked their lives and spent their careers in the criminal justice field, reforming it, working with incarcerated people. Uh, we met one some earlier, Mr. Warren, and there are many more in this room. Uh, and there are not, in fact, there are tens of thousands of people. There are hundreds of thousands of people, attorneys and public defenders and advocates who are already there. And there, are, and there are nonprofits that are doing great work, the Innocence Project, the Sentencing Project. So what, so, so what am I missing? What do we need? What is needed out there? Um, and, I, I, um, and what is missing in this whole debate about criminal justice? Then I happen to read another book. This book maybe fewer people have read, although it's getting well known, The Devil in the Grove. Has anyone heard of it or read it? It won the Pulitzer Prize for nonfiction in 2013. It's written by somebody named Gilbert King. It's about a case in Lakeland, Florida in 1949 where four African-American youths were falsely accused of rape. Lakeland, Florida is basically a southern town. It's outside of Tampa. And this is before the uh, Brown versus Board of Ed, before the Civil Rights Movement was national. And it's a really about all the atrocities that happened in the wake of this accusation. And Thurgood Marshall, the Marshall Project, Project who was the head of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund at the time, litigated basically to try to save these kids' lives, largely failed. It was a mind-boggling book. It's the most disturbing book I'd read in a long time. It's also a fabulously written book. I recommend it. So at the end of the book, 
there were letters. I had read the soft cover. And there were two letters from people who had grown up in Lakeland uh, who were clearly shattered by what they had read. They were white. They were, I would call them Christian. They both invoked the Bible. And they seemed truly people of goodwill. And they couldn't square this racist town that they read about with the town they grew up in in the 60s and 70s. And, of course, their parents and grandparents were in Lakeland during this period of, that they had read. And you could sort of hear them or read them trying to rationalize, you know, and what could you do? Like, my parents weren't racist, and we had a great life, and we played in the orange groves. And then it started hitting me. What if you lived in South Carolina or Mississippi or Florida, northern Florida, during the 1910s or 20s or 30s or 40s? Jim Crow was basically a system that was in place, which basically created two classes of citizens, African American and white. Um, what if you were a good person? What if you didn't believe in the system? What if you just, what could you do? There was no movement. What could you do? Well, you could be nice to people if they happen to work for you. You could be nice to your neighbors. But you know what you could really do about fighting Jim Crow? Pretty much nothing. And it hit me that if something is bad, and it doesn't matter what it is, if it's bad for a long period, the longer the duration, the more tolerable it becomes until it's not. But then it hit me, that's the criminal justice system. So of course I hadn't discovered anything. Everybody knows it, but there's no urgency. There is no outrage because it has been this way in some form for so long. So then that hit me. What do we have to do is we have to actually create a sense of urgency. Um, and how do you do that? So I'm going to tell you about the Marshall Project. I'm not saying this is the only answer. I think there are, as I said, there are people doing amazing things out there in the world. But I think this is what is going to fill a need. So the Marshall, I decided to, you know, come up with the Marshall Project. The Marshall Project is a journalism organization. We're not advocates. We don't help people. We don't deal with incarcerated people. We don't give job training. We don't help people on reentry. We're for all that. But we're just going to be covering and reporting truthfully, honestly, aggressively on things that involve the criminal justice system. Every story we do isn't going to conform to point of view. We will have debates, and we will have people for the death penalty, not for the death penalty. But based on my background and based on my reading of history, I actually believe that the, one of the great ways of uh, stimulating change in, in society is through truth-telling and storytelling. I'm a journalist. That's my roots. And I think if you go back to the Civil Rights Movement or you go back to the Vietnam War, let's say you were a reporter. You went to Vietnam in the 60s, and you had no opinion about the war, and all you did was report on, on it accurately. That's exactly what happened. And what happened was that helped change public opinion because what was happening in Vietnam was so disturbing. And it was the same in the Vietnam War, uh, in the Civil Rights Movement. The had reporters largely from the North would come and they'd say, well, the marchers are coming over the bridge and the dogs are being attacking the marchers. And people up North read it and that helped stimulate um, a real uh, change in the thinking and maybe even helped pass the Civil Rights Act. So in my opinion, Journalism is a great method, a great vehicle for changing opinion. But what we, we are not trying to change opinion. We have a very subversive goal, which a lot of the people in my shop now are not as comfortable as I am because they're journalists. Journalists are objective. Journalists, the value of journalism is inherently in its own right. But no, we have a goal. And it's a little vague, but I think it's also very important. And our goal is to stimulate or, let's say, to help spark a national conversation about criminal justice. In 2016, we're going to have a presidential election. The leading candidate uh, for the Democratic Party is Hillary Clinton. To my knowledge, Hillary Clinton had never made a comment about Ferguson and virtually never speaks about criminal justice. Her husband, Bill Clinton, a man I admire, mostly, passed the Crime Act 20 years ago, which was one of the things that led to the explosion of prison construction. Why is this? And yet, on the, on the right, whether it's Governor Perry in Texas, Governor Christie in New Jersey, I mentioned Senator Paul. There are Republicans who I would argue have been a little more out there, a little more aggressive in proponing, proposing reforms in criminal justice. Um, who knows who, who Willie Horton is? This will be an age issue. <laughs> who doesn't? OK. In 19, I'm trying to answer. I'm going to try to answer why Democrats don't um, don't take on criminal justice. In 1993, uh, Michael Dukakis, governor of Go uh, Massachusetts, was running against George Bush. Um, while he was governor, there was a prisoner named Willie Horton. He was out on furlough. While out, he committed a hor horrible crime. He raped a woman. He might have killed her. And um, when he ran against George Bush, 
um, George Bush's advisor, uh, Lee Atwater, said, I will attach Willie Horton to Michael Dukakis like bark on a tree. And anywhere Michael Dukakis went, they hear about Willie Horton, Willie Horton, Willie Horton. And Michael Dukakis, that program was flawed, obviously, and something horrible happened in its wake. But Michael Dukakis might be the last Democrat or national Democrat ever to run on a criminal justice platform because the last thing somebody wants to be in America is soft on crime. So uh, I am running out of time a little bit, but um, our goal, as I said, is to elevate this conversation. And so what are we? I'm going to describe us a little more now on the journalism side. Our editor, we appointed an editor, Bill Keller. Bill Keller was the uh, uh, executive editor of the New York Times, one of the most respected editors in the country. We're going to have a team of 25 people, tw 20 journalists, doing investigative reporting, videos, lists, everything. We partnered already with the Washington Post We're going to, uh, on a story about a man in Texas who was executed. And we had new evidence that virtually, virtually exonerated him. Um, uh, and, and, and we, we showed grotesque prosecutorial misconduct. Um, and I would guess, I would bet you, that the next time Governor Perry, this is a well-known case, Todd Winningham, the next time Governor Perry has to sign a death warrant in a controversial death penalty case, he'll think twice. Because when you can show that there are people who have been executed in this country who are, who are, uh, who are innocent, um, that should have a chilling effect on the death penalty in general. Um, so we have reporters all around the country. And we will have, um, uh, we will be writing, we will be partnering, we will be tweeting. We have a website, www.themarshallproject.org. I invite you to go on it and sign up for our newsletter. We're not, we're not publishing actively yet, but we will be in a month. Um, in terms of criminal justice itself, uh, it strikes me as kind of um, uh, a mystery to me. Not quite a mystery, but. You know, I've mentioned North Korea, and there are a lot of non-democratic countries where you would really expect um, uh, to have a heinous track record with respect to incarceration. They don't have a constitution. They have no laws. Um, but we have, in my opinion, again, as I said, I'm not a lawyer, we have one of the greatest systems in the world on paper. I mean, we are, uh, we have due process. You, you cannot be accused, you need to have a trial, you are entitled to a trial of your peers. We have Miranda warnings, so you cannot be forced to confess without being read these rights that they can be used against you. You do not have to, you do not have to testify against yourself. Um, we have this case of Gideon where uh, 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 accused people are, are entitled to counsel, even if they have no money, um, and on and on and on. Um, we, are, we have laws and, and things, uh, interpretation of the Constitution against cruel and inhuman punishment. Um, and yet, we've seen in many cases, uh, Central Park Five in New York, where people have confessed under some duress who were innocent. And due process is important, and a right to trial of your peers is important. Fewer than 5% of accused people actually get a trial. They usually plea out because they're afraid of the consequences or for overcrowding or whatnot. In terms of the right to counsel, I could cite articles in the New York Times recently which showed the, the really horrible state of a lot of public defender's offices around the country. They're underfunded. And so the right to counsel is, is in, for many, in many cases, um, uh, a myth or a promise. Uh, and finally, cruel and unusual. Um, we're going to do a lot of stories on solitary confinement. And what I'm learning is the way, you know, when solitary is, you're in, in a prison, it's dark for 22 hours, you get an hour of sunlight a day, and it's usually for people who have acted up and may be mentally ill. Um, but it is so random and arbitrarily applied. I cannot believe this has not been tested, or at least has successfully tested at the Supreme Court. So we have this beautiful system of the U.S. Constitution, and yet every day we're learning things um, uh, of, of, about, about um, what's wrong with the system. What also is striking to me about criminal justice is so much is wrong with it that has nothing to do with racism, although that is a factor, or police brutality, or prosecutorial misconduct. There are so many things we could be doing that are just so fixable. In New York State, the upstate New York is industrial, somewhat in decline, and so that's where the prisons have been built, because they need jobs. Okay, and there are prisons that could be closed, but they aren't closing them because they need jobs upstate. Now, a few years ago, we had a debate whether we should keep GM open in order to support the auto industry and jobs. That's a fairly, I'm a capitalist, I ran a hedge fund. I can see issues why you wouldn't do that. You should let companies fail if they have to fail. I can see why you would, that's a good debate. But we're incarcerating people, we're keeping prisons open to provide jobs? That's amazing, like that is amazing. 
But we live with that, and New York is not the only state. We have the privatization prisons. We have private prison companies running prisons. Well, that's more efficient, and you can argue. And yet, we now have prison companies testifying before legislatures against, uh, in favor of mandatory sentencing. So they are now lobbying and helping set policy. Private companies who have one interest, which is their, their P&L, their profit and loss statement. That's absurd. And on and on and on. So there are so many things that should be easy that you don't have to be a Democrat or you don't have to be a liberal to just be completely outraged by. And we hope to bring all of this to light. Finally, I do want to talk about the Marshall Project and the issue of race, because it comes up in our own offices all the time. Um, I think if, uh, if the United States uh, system was colorblind, it would still be highly flawed and there still might be a Marshall Project. But I also think that it's very important, even as we in the Marshall Project try to write about the people on the right who were um, for, for reform based on fiscal issues or libertarian issues, it's also very important never to lose sight of the critical and central role race plays in our criminal justice system. I don't want to exaggerate. I, um, I don't want to say there's two sets of laws. A lot of this has to do with how much money you have. But time and again, every story we look at has, has a racial component. The African-American community's relationship with its own police force tends to be very different than the white community. I raised kids in New York City. We were comfortable. We were privileged. Um, I never worried that my kid would be stopped and frisked. And uh, I'm going to assume that my kids had friends who may have smoked marijuana, which is illegal in New York. And they may have done other drugs. And I don't know anyone who went to jail. It's just a totally different experience. And I'm going to guess that in other communities, this experience is the opposite. And so I think it's very important when we at the Marshall Project do our journalism that we not lose sight of the central role, even though it alienates people. Because once you make something racial, you can ask the President of the United States, um, then it becomes a much uh, more divisive issue. But I don't want us to shrink from that. So the Marshall Project is coming out in a month. All this fire and brimstone I'm talking, you may not see it right away in the Marshall Project because we are nonpartisan, and I'm serious. We don't have positions about any th things I talked about. Our only position is that this should be f front and center in the political debate in the years to come. And so our plans, we are nonprofit which means we rely on, this is not a fundraising spiel, but it is important to know how these things do come together. It relies on, on contributions from foundations and individuals, and we have to perpetuate that and sustain ourselves, and that will be a big challenge. But we have a lot of plans. So originally, we we're going to just produce journalism, and we'll partner, and hopefully uh, we can be in the Cleveland Plain Dealer, and you should look for us on the website. But there's so many other things we want to do. I would love us to sponsor town hall meetings. Wouldn't it be great to have a Republican or somebody from the right and the left go around the country, have town hall meetings about crime? Because I haven't even talked about crime. Crime is a real issue. And local, uh, hook up with local television stations and engage the whole country on the issue of, of, uh, of uh, crime and criminal justice. And um, finally, documentary film. I am a documentary filmmaker. I think there's a, you know, vast um, opportunities for us to explore things. Um, but my real goal is that in 2016, um, when the Democrat and Republican nominees accept their uh, party's nomination and they talk about taxes and Russia and the Middle East and immigration, that they are forced, that we as a public force them to say something about mass incarceration or juvenile justice or mental health. Because I believe that criminal justice system is in, in badly need of repair. And I actually, maybe it's a naive notion, but I actually believe that honest Storytelling and truth-telling is one of the great ways to help spark this national conversation. So thank you, everybody, for coming. And I think we will be having questions in a little bit. Thanks. I'm Stephanie Jansky, Director of Programming for the City Club of Cleveland. Today we are enjoying a Friday forum featuring Neil Barsky, founder and chairman of the Marshall Project. We will return to our speaker momentarily for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We encourage you to formulate questions for our speaker now and remind you that questions should be brief and to the point and actually questions. We welcome all of you here today and those joining us via WCPN 90.3, WVIZ PBS, 104.9 WCLV Idea Stream, or one of the many radio stations across the region and country that carry City Club programs. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by a grant from Cleveland State University and PNC. 
Our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. Please join us on Friday, October 3rd, where we welcome Ann Neal, President and Co-Founder of the American Council of Trustees and Alumni. For more information about our upcoming and past forums, please visit our website at cityclub.org. Today's program is part of the City Club's annual forum on the American justice system, made possible by a generous endowment gift from Robert J. Fay, David Isendell, Myron Krodinger, Paul W. Walter, and Jesse Glassman, in memory of Samuel Glassman. Our community partner for today's program is Edwin's Restaurant and Leadership Institute. We thank you for your support. Today we welcome guests at tables hosted by friends of Maureen Mullen and Oberlin College. We thank you for your support. We also welcome students from Facing New Tech High School, Gilmore Academy, and Shaw High School. Student participation in today's program is made possible by the Charles E. Spar Charitable Trust. Will the students please stand and be recognized? Now we would like to return to our speaker for our traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone, including guests. Holding the microphones today are marketing and outreach specialist Kirsten Pianca and, and content associate Teddy Eisenberg. First question, please. Uh, Mr. Barsky, thank you for being here today. Uh, I retired from 40 years of uh, teaching English, mm -hmm. and yesterday I saw three students who I taught in the 80s. They complained about the journal writing they had to do, so I wish they could have heard your talk today. <laughs> <laughs> um, but the research has shown that the young people who are suspended from school have a, a more likely chance of ending up in the criminal justice system. And a government study recently showed that even though 18% of preschoolers in the nation are uh, African American, they make up almost half of children who are suspended. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about preschool, four-year-olds. Wow. So my question to you is, would you consider adding that possibly to your range of writing uh, <laughs> when, you, when you write about you know, criminal justice? I think it's important to go to where it starts uh, to address the issue. Uh, the answer is absolutely, we would. Um, the school to prison pipeline is what they, it's a term of art. Um, and I'm not, you're referring to a survey for preschool, but it's true, you know, up and down uh, through uh, public schools, especially in New York City. I'm not sure if it's the same in Cleveland. You know, um, I went to uh, not the toughest school in the world, but I went to private school. People were getting into fights. We got into fights. Nobody called the police, right? Uh, you'd call your parents, you'd call the principal. And there is this phenomenon now in schools where the police, where it becomes a, a matter of uh, police engagement. There's also pushback on that, but I, I, I can only agree with you. I, 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 if, if there are great stories, we'll write about it. That's obviously a fertile issue. We would not simply write about this issue like, isn't it a pity that this exists? Because we're looking for stories and we want to engage people. We don't want to preach the choir. But I, I completely agree with the premise of your question, which is that it's scandalous that A, there's a racial, such a racial disparity, but even the four-year-olds are suspended anyway. But um, so I, I, I agree with you and, and, and we're totally open to, to writing about that, yeah. Thank you very much. I want to underscore the welcome, your welcome to town. Just an observation that you had said there was, a, there was not an urgency. Within the African American community, there's always been an urgency mm -hmm. about the criminal justice system and the kinds of disparities that's been going on. Mm -hmm. We just haven't had the effective means ongoingly to, to address it. Mm -hmm. Cleveland is a very fertile community. The late Congresswoman Stephanie Tubbs Jones, who was the original, one of the original co-authors of the Second Chance Act, mm -hmm. uh, you know, brought criminal justice to the national forefront of the mm -hmm. nation's consciousness. So you'll find community, uh, find the Cleveland community very ready to, to, to follow the lead mm -hmm. that you're taking there. And we're glad to see you taking that lead. My question was, how will your efforts at the national level connect with local communities here that are actively involved and have been over time mm -hmm. uh, with criminal justice issues? Uh, it's a good question, and it's something we think about because we want to have a national imprint. We want to have as many hits and page views and everything as everybody else. And yet so much of what is happening is local and so much of the horrible stories. But we will be covering, as I said, we have a reporter in Denver and in, and in Austin and in Boston. And we want to, I, I think the, the true answer is, journalistically what would happen is something happens in Cleveland. 
um, that has national, not national implications, but has, has larger implications. So there's a case in Denver we just learned of, um, uh, of a guy that was uh, convicted of an armed robbery and he was given, uh, I think, six consecutive 13-year sentences. And um, by mistake, the uh, judge or maybe the prison put in six concurrent sentences. So he served 13 years and he was released. For the next 10 years, he lived a very good, clean life. He had a family and he, um, uh, he had a business. And then someone discovered the clerical error. And now they're throwing him back. Now, that's a local story, but everyone you can hear, that has emotional resonance. So a good story to us is a good story. I mean, uh, so I think we're looking for great stories. And um, I'll give you my, my email address is nbarsky at themarshallproject.org if anyone wants to send story ideas. Um, so, but it's a good point because there are things that are so localized that maybe it will be harder to write about in a, for a national audience, but that's the balance. But great stories are re that resonate for people, um, and our readership will be inherently interested in criminal justice. So n I'm not sure the exact way to address that, but uh, I think we're looking for good stories that have larger meaning, I suppose. Actually, we've got some excellent local good story writers. Okay, great. Uh, Mr. Barnsky, you've had a very uh, distinguished career in at least three different, three very disparate areas, mm -hmm. uh, finance, uh, journalism, and lately in filmmaking. Mm -hmm. You've also been a very uh, astute observer of the American scene. But more and more uh, commentators are noting the disparity between an American, the rich and the poor. Do you feel that is a, a gulf that can be somehow addressed? And if so, uh, do you have any suggestions as to how that gulf can be bridged? Well, I guess my opinion is worthwhile as anyone that's in the room, but really no more than that. I don't have a strong view of, uh, I, I agree that there's a huge disparity in income in America and it's growing and it's bad, and it has to do with tax policy, and it has to do with the values of the country, it has to do with the decline of manufacturing, it's multifaceted. Um, and I would be in favor of higher taxes on the wealthy and other things that would uh, remediate the, the gap that you, uh, that you talk about. But I don't claim any special insight, and nor have I spent a lot of time actually trying to, um, trying to come up with a, any grand idea. I think um, your, 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 your solution would probably be every bit as good as mine. Hi, my name is Michaela Hope. I'm a student from Shaw High School, 10th grade, and I like to be a journalist also. My question to you is, how can high school students get involved in the Marshall Pro Project? How can, Mar how can high school students get involved in the Marshall Project? It's a great question, but I don't have a great answer. I mean, we are, I'm afraid. Um, I, we will, you should write us if you have ideas and if you want to write, and I, I, I want to encourage you, but I, I, I don't want to make it, I don't want to be more hopeful than I am. We, what we're doing now is, you know, b hiring people with a lot of experience in writing and things like that. But we do have internships, and I think uh, if you personally have an interest, then you should write me and tell me about your interest, and we can correspond. Uh, in terms of the actual publications and things like that, I, I'm not really sure yet. Um, but we will have internships, and if something is happening in your community, say this is an amazing story. I'd like to write it. I, I mean, we will listen uh, and welcome it. Um, but I also want to temper your, I don't want to, I don't want to make it seem easier than it is, um, but I would be happy to hear from you at a minimum. Sure. Mr. Barsky, welcome yeah. to Cleveland. Thanks. Your program is a tough one. Your objective is a, is a tough one. Earlier this summer, an individual was executed in Arizona. Mm -hmm. It took him over two hours or about two hours to be executed. Yeah. If we looked at the clock, we have been here for 40 minutes listening to you and your questions. Mm -hmm. Times three is how long that individual laid on the gurney mm -hmm. to be executed. Yet America didn't seem to be that outraged. Our office wrote an editorial regarding it. Mm -hmm. Both leading papers in Ohio didn't pick up on it, didn't want to publish it. The blogs that day when he was executed contained mostly comments, hang him high, he suffered great. How will your project change that mindset in America? Mm -hmm. After all, it was a story that had a lot of 
dressing, window yeah. dressing around it and a lot of drama, three hours or two hours, three times this is a long time, with that descriptive element, we still couldn't catch the attention of the American public. Uh, I might argue with you about that. I think the, the Bosch execution in Oklahoma, the one I remember, I think did get the attention of the American public. And I think it, not just the people who were already focused on it, I think the succession of these um, does get people's attention. Not, we don't get everything we want. We don't get a, every article published we want. But I do think this is one of the things I was talking about earlier. There's so much percolating. And I think there's this huge backlash against these uh, drug injections. And we had a, we had a, um, uh, uh, an anesthesiologist come in and talk to us. And his mission is to eliminate these, these drugs and these forms of executions. And it was harrowing what he was explaining in the pictures he was showing of many botched, 10 or 12% of the executions that are in, injections are messed up. Uh, and almost the definition of cruel and inhuman punishment. Um, so I will push back. I do think that these things do have an impact, and I think if we were around, hopefully we would have participated in writing about it. And I also think, and I'm not 100% sure of this, but I, I think I agree with our approach, which is that writing things down the middle is better than being a serious advocate. And I'll give you an example. We did an article a month ago, before we actually published with the Washington Post, I mentioned about a, a guy in Texas, Todd Willingham, who is accused of um, committing uh, arson and, and killing th three daughters and his wife in Corsa County, Texas. Um, and the uh, evidence was based on uh, forensic evidence from uh, so-called arson experts and a jailhouse snitch who says, he told me he did it. So he was executed. It was very controversial at the time. It was 2004. Subsequently, the Innocence Project uh, and the advances in science showed that the forensic evidence was completely bogus. No, no, no expert in arson could have ever claimed that and, um, um, and then we did a story where the snitch recanted and said that the prosecutor had wined and dined him and he'd gotten somebody else to pay for his classes. None of this was revealed to the uh, defense. And so he was executed based on basically two debunked, okay? So this was a two-page story in the Washington Post from the front page and then two pages inside. And I got calls from friends and said, it was a good story, but why didn't you connect the dots? Why didn't you say about this is an example of the outrageousness of the death penalty? Or why didn't you make that point? Why didn't you shake us by the lapels? But then I got a call from my friend Ann. Ann worked for the Bush administration. She's a Republican. She's a law and order person. And she was shook up by that story. She might even be for the death penalty. Precisely because we were not writing to the people who want us to shake them by the lapels. Now, it's really tempting. And I'm to do that. But I actually think, I start off saying, the reality is so bad, you don't have to. This is the premise of the Marshall Project. I could be wrong. But I think the reality is so bad that you do not have to be a partisan or an activist. All you have to do is report the truth. Two and a half million people are incarcerated. We have the highest rate of imprisonment in the world. We have, I don't remember how many people in, we're the only country, we were, until a recent Supreme Court decision, that would convict to sentence uh, juveniles to life in prison. So something you did when you were 13 or 14, you will never see the light of day. We were the only country in the West that did that. Now there's been a, a Supreme Court case overturning it. So these are just facts. I didn't say it was bad. Even if I said I agreed with it, it doesn't matter. These facts are, uh, I think, sufficient. I could be wrong. So that's the premise. Uh, I'm sympathetic to your view, which is like, where's the outrage? Like, where's the excitement? But things may happen slower than we want. But I do think that the truth will out. Hello. Um, my name is Jess Geis, and I'm, um, I really appreciate your talk today. Um, you mentioned that many of the incarcerations are due to drug-related infractions. Mm -hmm. um, and I was just wondering if you had any data or stories that related um, the decriminalization of drugs to the impacts on the criminal justice system. Are the incarceration rates different? You know, how does, how, it, is, there, is there any data related to this? Um, it's a good question to which I do not have an answer. <laughs> I do know that in Brooklyn, there's a new, there's a new DA name is Kenneth Thompson, and we went to see him. And I do, this is anecdotal because I don't have a good answer for your question. Um, he did uh, recently um, say that he was going to throw out all uh, pot uh, arrests that were misdemeanors because, because it was clogging up his system. They were mostly thrown out anyway. And it was actually turned out to be a way for cops to get overtime 
because you bring a kid in, and they were 98% happening in the African American community, uh, which is not the percentage of either the population of Brooklyn or the people who consume marijuana. So he threw it out. Now, I don't know if that's led to a, a, a big decline in the numbers of arrests overall. I don't know. It probably would to some degree. I find the numbers take a long time. You know, Colorado's legalized marijuana and <coughs> other states are decriminalized. It doesn't, I don't, I, I, I'm not sh shirking the question, but I, I don't think it shows up very quickly in the numbers, but it should over time, definitely. It seems to me that journalism as a profession has taken such a drastic change over the last 20 years with the changes. It, and it would appear to me also that that would make your uh, task far more difficult. I'd appreciate if you would comment on how you, if you feel that is an issue. How do you mean it's changed? Well, I mean that there's so many different avenues. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I'm a regular newspaper reader. I used to get up every morning and read that newspaper cover to cover. In Cleveland, we don't even have a daily newspaper except for three days a week. Um, <sighs> there are all these avenues on the right. internet and all this type of stuff that are so fragmented, it would appear Absolutely to me. Absolutely right. How do you intend to get o over that? Well, I mean, it is what it is. First, I agree, the newspaper industry is imploded. The business model doesn't exist, and it's a tragedy. It's a tragedy for cities like Cleveland and cities even like New York uh, and cities like Denver, which has had its daily close, the New Orleans. It's, it's going to happen. It's going to continue. And, and I think it's a tragedy. But I would also say, as you point out, there have been things that were taking its place uh, of the daily newspaper that are online, that are decent, that are different, that are. And so, yes, it's become more fragmented. Um, uh, from our perspective, that's neither a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, we're nonprofit. So there's no business model that would support the Marshall Project. We're never going to get, you know, the local car dealer to advertise on our site or anything like that. So we're going to, we are either uh, beneficiaries of the changes because we can make that pitch to foundations that we deserve support, which 10 or 15 years ago, nonprofit journalism was barely existed. So there are things taking the place of the traditional newspaper in the sense that, uh, but you also said, about different, you know, how fragmented is, there are better ways to reach people, too. I mean, I miss newspapers. I still read the New York Times every day and many newspapers. I love them. But there are many other better ways, and there are many ways to tell a story beyond just the traditional newspaper, photography, videography, lists. Um, and you can engage with audiences better when you're digital, right? You can hear back from people. People can, can write for you within, for free and all these other wonderful things. So we will benefit as well uh, from the new situation. But I agree from a societal perspective, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's almost tragic that the, new, that the model newspaper where the local advertiser would support the ingathering of news that people may or may not want to pay for is over. Hi, my name's Hi. Lenita Edwards, and I'm from Shaw High School. Um, I appreciate you inviting us to this event. Um, my question for you is, what were some of your challenges you had during your journey, and how did you get through those challenges? And was there someone in your life that told you to keep going? Well, I had so many different challenges at different times, so it wouldn't be one person. But I would say our challenges today are financial, which is not going to be solved today. But raising money is a big challenge, and I just know I'm, I'm, I'm a... I'm, I'm accustomed to the, to the struggle, and, I'll, and we'll get there. Overall, um, I would say that I know through journalism, filmmaking, and even on Wall Street, I failed at everything I did before I succeeded. Everything. And I had friends whose journalism careers just took off when we were in our 20s. Just took off. And I struggled. And I had a, I don't want to tell you, it wasn't that demeaning, but I mean, I was unemployed for a while and I had a freelance for a while and I had a beg bar. And it happened. And I think that made me the tortoise and they were the hare, you know. And so I have kids at 24, 19. My, my daughter just graduated social work school. She's looking for jobs. It's not easy. And I'm giving her this inspiration. But it's true. You know, you have a setback everything you do. Everything, everyone. And if you don't, you're screwed. Because you will. And then you won't know what to do about it. So, you know, I, I don't know who's inspired me. I mean, there are many people along the way. I'd say my parents were great, and I did have teachers. I had a teacher, I had a history school teacher, George Kirshner, 
who probably had a bigger impact on my mind and my education, not to take any away from the Oberlin professors who were great, but this man did amazing things that, that endure to this day and that I won't forget. So it's a lot of things, but, um, but I know that I failed at everything, or I felt I had before I didn't. Oh. <coughs> hey, my name is Kayvon Young, and I go to Facing History New Tech. And one of our questions is, um, what, what was the most success successful story that motivated you? What's the most successful story? That motivated you. That motivated on. me? Mm -hmm. Well, um, I mentioned my parents growing up and my father and mother. Uh, my father was very engaged in, in civil rights and, and even as he, he became a businessman and then he retired and he did amazing things in Nicaragua and he's always inspired me and he's much to the left of me. He's a much more radical than I am. Um, but I would say the incident, the thing I did that most inspired me was when I was in high school, as I mentioned, this history teacher. In 1974, the city of Boston had a court-mandated um, busing plan. I know Cleveland had one, too, that, uh, that, that, that forced the uh, communities to integrate their schools. And people had to go to buses to different communities. And there was this huge backlash, in, particularly in the working-class white areas. And there were almost race riots. It was very disturbing. It was a national story. And my teacher, we went to a private school, very small, very progressive. We called teachers by their first names. He said, hey, guys, why don't you go up there and see what, what's going on? And with what? And so they, four of us went up in a car, had a half inch videotape, black and white, slept on somebody's floor. And for a week, we went to the schools and we interviewed kids in South Boston, which is a white Irish Catholic area, and Roxbury, which an African American was and is an African American community. And we came back and we did a documentary on the Boston busing crisis. And um, uh, that, and I just saw it again for the first time in 40 years, and our hair is long and we're kind of mumbling and bumbling, but it was like <laughs> an incredible impactful experience, which I'm now reconnecting to, frankly, through this project. Um, so, you know, it's never one thing, but um, there are various things along the way that make a difference. Hi. Uh, Hi. Neil, you, you alluded to the fact of Dukakis and how Democrats are afraid of being painted to the left, so they always tack to the right, and that um, mm -hmm. uh, Hillary is doing the same thing. And her husband, but can you explain why after Clinton got elected the second time, he mm -hmm. still pursued the same path? And further, President Obama has used pardon less than <sighs> any other president in modern history. Right. Now, he's not going to run for office again. He could take a different tack this second term. He showed no inclination to do so. Well, I'll separate them. Um, in the case of Clinton, I think... Um, he, I, I, all I would say is we li did live in a different world then. And crime was pretty much at a peak in, its, in the early 90s. And there was a lot of public pressure on all politicians to do something. And I, I'm not saying I agree with this, but building more prisons was one of the ways to do that. And so uh, I'm not, I don't want to give him a pass, and I am sort of, but it was definitely a different historical context when he was doing that. Uh, it had horrible, horrible, long implications. Because once you build the prisons, as I said, you've got to fill them and you got to pay for them. And the federal government didn't pay for them and didn't fill them. That, left, that was left to the states. President Obama, I, I, I'm scratching my head a little about the pardons, but, you're, but he has two years, you're right. Um, I think um, Attorney General Holder, soon to be former, has done a lot of very interesting things the last few, last year or two in terms of sentencing guidelines and um, uh, various reforms with respect to drug crimes, conforming the laws for cocaine and crack and making them the same. Um, I, I think your question is a larger question about the president, which again, I don't feel particularly equipped to answer. I would only say that uh, anytime he has done anything that has selectively helped the African American community has been slaughtered. And that doesn't excuse it. His lack of action on pardons, which may or may not even affect blacks, it could affect everybody. Um, I think, I, so I don't know, but I, I would just, again, I don't want to give him a pass, but um, uh, he has a burden and a wall to climb that other presidents haven't had on this sort of issue. So I suspect um, this is a battle he's chosen not to fight, rightly or wrongly. So maybe we wouldn't have a health care plan if he had done this. I don't know. Um, so I sound like I'm defending him, but I do think that um, you're right. In the next two years, he has money, for, especially after the midterm elections, and others have commented that it could be a good time 
to more aggressively use uh, the pardon since he has no, and it would be good for Hillary actually, to get all that out of the way. Um, so, you know, your guess is as good as mine. The, the, the fear, which was just uh, mentioned uh, in politics of being perceived as soft on crime, makes it very hard to construct any coalition to affect any kind of political mm -hmm. change or system, systemic yeah. reform. Will the Marshall Plan consider writing project? A Marshall, let's not go crazy. It's not the Marshall Plan. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. You, you, you. you have a good lineage in your name. <laughs> You're right. Will your project take on the political side of storytelling too, uh, or just uh, try to outrage people? Oh no. Well, again, we're. I mean, go back. We're journalists. We will definitely cover the politics of criminal justice. Absolutely. And why, why is Rand Paul more out there than, than the president on many issues? I, I think that's completely valid. We will have somebody in Washington reporting about all of that. Um, so I would say absolutely. It's totally valid. Today at the City Club, we have been listening to a forum featuring Neil Barsky, founder and chair of the Marshall Project. Thank you, Mr. Barsky. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned.